at such a such a difficult time. Uh, you think, let's start from, from that, uh, you think the Fed should pause. Why? Yeah, I do think they should pause for a few reasons. One is, I think we're in the early stages, not the late stages of this banking situation. Uh, I think there's been a uh, pretty significant change for the prospects of small and mid-sized banks. They provide most of the lending to small, mid-sized businesses in the United States. And uh, we've just seen the first phase of this, which is the asset liability mismatch, which is sort of the most obvious issue. But the credit issues are about to start. And I think that's why you're seeing the reaction in the markets. The, the other issue for me is, from a risk management point of view, if I were sitting in the seat, I think it's more important to be able to sustain the current rate for an extended period of time, longer than the market thinks, than get another 25 or 50 basis points and risk having to cut again. I think that would be very troubling. And uh, I'd say one more, one more comment. If I were at the Fed, I'd call out that we need a whole of government approach to fight inflation. Right now, the Fed is saying, we've got this. Uh -huh. We can solve it. I don't think that's the case. I think you need fiscal restraint. I think you probably need to look at other policies that are outside the Fed. And so I, I would pause here. Okay, but right now you've got it still pretty much priced in to do a rate hike on Wednesday. Yes. 25 basis points. Uh, why not? If your inflation is still high, why not do one more to sort of put a cap on all that you've done and signal, you know, and th thinking of inflation expectations and more signal that you're, you're still hawkish when it comes to inflation. You've just got an eye on this, this yeah. banking, whatever you want to call it. So this is my preference. I would prefer to do a, uh, what's called the hawkish pause, not raise, but signal that we're in a tightening uh, stance because I actually think the banking situation may well be more serious than we currently understand it. And I'd like to turn over a few more cards rather than regret not doing that three months from now. Okay, put on your, your former Goldman Sachs vice chair hat. Uh, if you were advising a desk, a trading desk, an investment desk, what do you think the risk is now? Have we, have we not seen the end of it? it seemed, we know that there's shorts out there. There are no people are nervous. But is there fundamental risk right now that could keep this small and medium-sized banking turmoil problem going? Yeah, normally when we're discussing problems with banks, it's after we've been through a credit cycle. We have not been th We haven't even started the credit cycle. We've just had an asset liability mismatch issue where banks were overinvested in long-term treasuries and bank equity has been marked down just based on that. We've got the credit issues yet to come. We're at a different stage in the cycle, and, uh, and there's also uh, potential deposit instability down the road when those credit issues start to unfold. And so I would say we're in the second or third inning of this situation, not the first inning, or seventh inning, I should say. We just finished the first phase, potentially, but there's a lot more to go. The credit phase, I think, normally is more serious. Robert, on your point about pausing at this moment, uh, you don't expect that there might be the risk that if you pause at this level, that you might be forced to hike again like we saw with Australia. And what is really more detrimental to credibility at this point? Yeah, so I think there's a way to position this. And let's say they raise, then pause, or they pause and and signal uh, so-called hawkish pause. Either way, the rhetoric needs to be that the Fed stands ready to raise rates. All you're doing is we've raised a lot very quickly. We want to absorb and digest some of it. I think people will, will understand it, think it's prudent, but signal we're prepared to do more. And I think the markets will understand that message if they give that message. On your concerns about credit tightening, coming at a time when we saw the jolts numbers really fall, we're seeing layoffs at a two, three year high. Um, how concerning is this for the most vulnerable part of this, of the American population, especially when you're thinking, that a lot of people will be left out when inflation is this fast. So, so normally, at this stage, you worry about the unemployed. Right now, we're in a crisis of the employed. The problem that's going on out there, 50 million workers that make $50,000 a year or less cannot make ends meet, OK? And part of it is there's been a substantial amount of fiscal spending, which hasn't stopped, by the way. Uh, and substantial amount of monetary easing. 
and really the low moderate income families are paying the price of it. So you do need some adjustment in the labor market. We've got demographically in the United States shortage of workers for as far as the eye can see at 50,000 or less. And so I think you could tolerate some loosening in the labor market. Uh, I'm, I'm more worried about the family who is working but tells me they can't make ends meet. And that is a widespread group of people right now. Robert, Sherry mentioned the credibility issue, and it's an interesting one, especially when it comes to potentially the RBA signaling this is a, a dilemma too, right? Do you think that the global window for tightening is closing and that's why we saw the surprise move from the RBA? And is that something that the Fed would be considering as well? I don't think there's a so-called quote-unquote window on uh, tightening. I, I think that uh, we've done so much so fast I actually think a pause here to absorb and understand better what's going on with this banking situation uh, would be understood by the market. And I think you still, if the language is set up properly, you will continue to extend the window for time. I don't buy that there's a window and it's closing. I, I think that could, could uh, push you into making a mistake with that type of thinking. Speaking of mistakes, does the Federal Reserve bear responsibility for what is happening to these banks? Uh, way slow to start, they've admitted that. Then suddenly, record speed of hikes. D uh, does that mean that they helped lay the groundwork and almost tempt some of these banks to get into the positions they got in? I don't blame the Fed for making the hikes, although I would have eased off monetary policy a couple of years ago so these weren't necessary. But once they had to do it, I don't blame them for that. I do think there's a problem with a lack of supervision once they knew they were in a hiking mode. And I think it was up to the Fed to supervise and make sure that if there were outliers, like two of the largest 15 banks, that they caught that early so we wouldn't be going through what we're going through right now. Let's step back a step further, okay? Uh, you've been, you left the Fed in 2021. Uh, the new framework was being put in place, the new framework said, oh, we're not going to raise rates until we're well above 2 percent, until we've got maximum employment. Is that another factor that helped set the stage for where we are now? It might have. As you know, I dissented uh, on the guidance in, the, in September of 2020. It was the only dissent I ever made at the Fed, but I dissented because I thought locking into that guidance uh, did not make sense. Uh, and I wish that that hadn't been done. But yes, that may have led the Fed to be more inclined to keep buying bonds, to be later to raise rates. And, it, and, I, and I've said probably many, many times, taking the foot off the accelerator earlier would have made it so they didn't have to slam on the brakes like they're doing right now. What do you think is the big challenge for the Fed and the federal government right now? Is there something that they need to do in lockstep? Yeah. Here's the issue. There's the monetary policy element of this, cyclical part, but we've got a few other issues. We, we need more fiscal discipline. We still have a lot of fiscal spending in the pipeline. And right now, the federal government, in my view, is working in some ways at cross purposes with the Fed. Energy policy and the integration to the transition is being done on the backs of low moderate income families. There's many actions outside the Fed that are making it harder for people making 50 grand a year or less to make ends meet. And yes, I think you want a whole of government approach to inflation, not just a Fed does this alone approach. Will the government still be functioning in the next few months, I guess, is the key question. I mean, we come back to always the U.S. debt ceiling issues, yeah. uh, default possibility June 1st. We know sort of where this is going, but if we continue to see that standoff, what will be the implications? So there's the back and forth of the standoff, which is going to stress people out. But there's a real issue in here. As we sit here right now, we haven't even gone into a downturn. The deficit is right now already 10 percent of GDP. We actually have a legitimate issue about the need for more fiscal restraint. Uh, and if this game of chicken, I don't like the tactics and I don't, I don't think it's healthy to be threatening or, or making people worried about default, but the discussion about uh, controlling spending is necessary. And I think uh, 50 million families that can't make ends meet out there, I think might welcome that debate. Final 
Quick, quick question, quick answer. Uh, in June, in July, in August, are we still going to be where we are? Is the Fed going to, in effect, have been done hiking rates? Do you think there's more to come? How is this going to play out? I think getting from where we are down to, say, 4% headline inflation will be doable. I think what we're going to find is it's going to be very sticky to get headline inflation below that. The wage price spiral of people making 50000 or less is alive and well and intense. Uh, and that's going to affect services inflation. So I think this is going to be a two- or three-year battle, not a six-month battle. I'm not in the school. Some people talk about this as like a fever, and if you raise rates high enough, you break the fever. I don't think that's a proper analogy. I think this is a chronic situation. You need whole-of-government uh, approach, and I think it may take two or three years of a consistent fight. And so if I were at the Fed in my old seat, I'd be worried about keeping rates stable at this level, understanding this fight is going to be a lot longer than most people think and the markets think.